Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Dodgeball Podcast. Going to spend some time in the Great Lakes area recapping this past weekend's Grand Rapids Open Tournament with Kevin Bailey. Kevin, thank you so much for hopping on last minute and for being willing to lend your insight and your thoughts on the events that transpired this past weekend. I definitely appreciate you hopping on, man. Well, thank you for so much for having me. Oh, for sure, man. So uh, I'm kind of at a disadvantage, and I hate to admit it. I, I am very saturated uh, on the West Coast and the Southwest. or I mean, we're, we're pretty much part of L.A., um, no matter how you paint it. So I, I kind of just i will ask you like a simple question. Can you tell me about the tournament? What was it, and how did it come to be? Sure. Um, so I am I believe this is the third uh Grand Rapids Open, it might be the fourth actually, um, and it's run by uh, a handful of the guys that play for uh, Grand Rapids Kraken, that would be Tony Stumpo, uh, Calvin Coster, Paul Hillebrand, those are the main guys that uh, run this tournament, um, and this year was was a really fun one, I would say it would be the, the best GR Open that we've had, uh, and that's thanks to how many, uh, how many of the teams from the North region showed up, uh, the competition was definitely the best that we've had in in the last couple of years so it was a lot of fun it was an interesting format actually that that we played with but um all in all it was really fun and it was a good uh i guess preview for the for the north region rounds because those are coming up here in a couple months nice so you said this is the third one third annual yeah it, actually it might be the fourth uh and i apologize for not knowing that they're <laughs> they're probably gonna be mad at me for not knowing that um but yeah it's been a little bit of a different format each year, uh, and this year we uh, it was split. There was a foam division, uh, and that was with our set teams. So uh, all of the teams that uh, showed up from the North Region got to be with their own teammates for that. And then uh, the second half of the tournament was uh, pinch division, um, but instead of sticking with our normal teams, we did uh, a draft, and we did it the night before, uh, and there was just. 10 captains picked and we went through and drafted the entire team. So it, it was fun to get to play with, with different people, uh, people that you've been competing against for years. But uh, in this case, we got to be teammates and it really added a new aspect to uh, the Grand Rapids Open that I thought was really enjoyable. Gotcha. Yeah, it's pretty cool when you can line up alongside somebody that you're not normally doing that with, like you're usually playing against them. Um, so you said draft. What was... Uh how was what was that like? It was just ten ten people that agreed to be uh, captain of a team, and they just picked and pulled, or yeah. So uh, so Tony Stumpo, as I mentioned, was the the main guy that was organizing all of this. He's a player on Kraken, um, and he lives in Grand Rapids, and he just uh, gathered up ten guys that uh, would be in town the night before, uh, and that's when we decided to do the draft. So um, for the most part, it was players from the state of Michigan that were there. Uh, but we had a couple of uh, captains that came from Ohio. We actually had Eric Stone came from Minnesota, and he was there in time uh, the night mo- before to draft. So uh, we all just gathered in his living room and and drafted teams. Nice, Eric Stone. I think he was just at the uh, the Tribune tournament. I think, and he's yeah, his yeah. name's popping up a lot. Um, yep. So yeah, TC Bush was there, and then uh, they came out to this one as well, and they 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 actually won the foam division of this tournament too. Nice. Um, earlier you said uh, different format. So was this, um, and I, sorry, this is just the bias speaking, was this NCDA format where you have these massive courts or did you guys play like elite style or what was the uh, the layout of that? Uh, so, yeah, so it, it was different than NCDA. So in, in, in NCDA, which is uh, collegiate dodgeball, there's we play on the full basketball court. Um, this tournament was much closer to elite style. Uh, I would say it was the same uh, width as an elite court, but uh, there was a 27-foot throw line, so it was a little bit longer of a court. Um, but yeah, all, almost all of the rules were uh, similar to elite uh, when it came to uh, gameplay. Uh, there, there were the few thing, few things that were different were the 27-foot throw line, obviously, and then also we were playing with soft boundaries which means uh if you have one point of contact in bounds you're still in so you could step out uh with one foot as long as the other foot was still touching in bounds uh it was in so those were those were a couple of things that were different but for the most part it was the same as elite 
Gotcha. Um, it's funny you mentioned that because I was watching a replay, and it might have might have been you. Forgive me. It might have been Dylan, but basically it was one of you guys against like Ketchum and I think Glenn and all them. And he was um, staying alive for a very long time, but like it's exactly as you said. Like he had one foot out of bounds over the line, and I was just like not losing my mind while watching. I was like, what what's going on? Like, are they gonna are they gonna call that or? Because it looks like he was clearly over, but that just seemed like that was part of the game or like he was getting away with it. So soft lines. I think Paige mentioned that too, where um, you can have like an entire limb out of bounds, but as long as you have one yeah. limb and you're still good. Uh, but were there any other variations, um, any other differences in how the tournament was run or rule sets or anything else that uh, I guess for a non uh, NCDA north player such as myself might might be aware of yeah so uh actually one that uh everyone that's in elite dodgeball would um kind of be surprised about would be uh the way that each uh each game went so uh we had pool play and then we had bracket play and um each game instead of or each match instead of being a best two out of three or best three out of five or whatever it might be uh we had an interesting way of doing it. It was a 10 minutes timed game. Um, but on top of that, um, you get a point every time you score, uh, or every time you eliminate the entire other team. Uh, and whoever has the most points at the end of 10 minutes wins. But uh, instead of after one point ending uh, with, with a team eliminating the other team, uh, and then you both starting with your full rosters back on the on the next point. Um, you start the very next point with the same players that you have left in. So it's hard to explain, but for example, uh, Team A is going up against Team B, Team B, and to start the game, they both have six players in, uh, and Team A wins, uh, and they end up with only two players left at the end of that point. The next point would start with uh, the team that lost that point, having all six players back into the game. Uh, but the team that had just won the point, they only have those two guys in to start the, to start the next game. Huh. So yeah, it, it, it was, it was a weird way to play, but it makes every single out, uh, equal to the next one. So, uh, it was definitely an interesting variation and, uh, they did it that way last year as well. Uh, so if you won a point, but you only had one guy left at the end, it wasn't as huge as uh, as it would be in in a elite tournament where it's just best two out of three. Uh, because the very next point, that that person is standing on the back line, and they're the only guy to start the point. So, uh, wow, they have to have to pick off as many people as they can before another point starts. So, uh, the benefit of it was that every single game was pretty close because no team was really rolling over their opponent, winning every single point with all six players left on the court. Um, so it made every game close where the score would be something like three to two. Uh, and if it was tied, then it, would, it went down to who had more players left on the court at the end of the game. So there were a lot of games that uh, the final score was like two to two or three to three. Uh, and team A had six people left and team B only had three people left. So they won. Wow. That's that's really interesting. I, I don't think I've ever heard of that before. Um, that's funny because, like, you can you can win, like you know, you have that one v one battle, and then you're probably just gassed, and then all of a sudden, oh crap, I got to take on six guys now, and then um, you're also, I guess, maybe rewarding people that actually did win with uh, six or five of their guys still on their team. Like you kind of, um, I don't want to say it favors that because you said it didn't really happen too much, but it's kind of like a bonus, right? If you just, if you won, if you rolled through one team, you had six guys left, you kind of just start over versus having to start one, two, three, four men down. That's really Definitely. cool. Yeah, that's, that's really yeah. interesting. And it, and it was weird. Uh, I guess none of us were really used to it, so it affected the way that we played and, and maybe we were thinking too much about it. But yeah, you couldn't really, even if you're up six players left and there's only one person on the other team, um, you can't be really reckless trying to get a catch uh, just because you think your teammates are going to get the guy out still. Um, you, had, you had to understand that uh, 
every out matters the exact same as the next one because uh, if you have six people left and you're going up against one and then you know two of your players get out by dropping a catch that maybe they wouldn't have reached for uh, in the first place, uh, now all of a sudden the next point you only get to start with four players on the court uh, compared to the other team's six. So it made it more of back and forth games uh, and it made every single game uh, closer than, than it would be otherwise. But uh, yeah, there were definitely some, some benefits and some drawbacks to, to the style. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, I like what you said about you, you made, even if you're in a situation where it's six against one, instead of acting crazy and, and being silly, trying to get like a catch or what have you, you know, you're not going to be as reckless. So it, it seems like people are going to be a little more aware of what they were doing. Okay. Yeah, that, that's really cool. Um, I'm, I'm definitely going to see if, um, well, I don't know what the likelihood of having that happen in, in Arizona would be, but if um, if that ever came my way, I'd, I'd definitely play that style. That's, that seems really awesome, and just another fun way to uh, to switch up the the gameplay a little bit. So um, that variation where you can have one limb out of bounds and one limb in that didn't really mess anybody up as far as uh, gameplay or game style goes. Oh uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think it was. A pretty natural switch for anyone that was coming from uh, elite tournaments where obviously you uh, you have the hard boundaries and you have to keep uh, keep all your limbs in bounds uh, to stay in uh, so it was a pretty uh, a pretty easy transition for those people uh, and it's funny you, you mentioned this because actually uh, for myself as well as uh, a lot of other players that came from uh, college dodgeball and moved into the elite scene uh, it was it was the opposite actually where uh, we started playing where uh, as we grew in the sport of dodgeball we were playing uh, where you could have one limb out of bounds and then when we switched to the hard boundaries it made uh, a big difference for us and there were times when uh, I would step out of bounds and it would be just a pointless out in elite uh, and I know that happens for a lot of other players uh, that came from the NCDA uh, and went into elite from there. Gotcha. Yeah, there's nothing more frustrating than a, a pointless out. That's exactly. Just, that happens. Uh, any anytime we switch from like a neutral zone to a, a center line, it's bound to happen. You're bound to watch somebody just walk on over across the line, like they're gonna light somebody up, and then everyone's just staring at them, like, "Hey, you're you're out, buddy." And it's like the worst, funniest thing at the same time. It just it just sucks to go out that way. Um, yeah, definitely. Speaking of transitions, so going from from foam to pinch is that. Uh, is that something that you do normally or is that something that is that takes some time or how, how did you adjust to that um so so actually for me personally this was i think the first time that i've played in a tournament where we started uh with foam and then from there we went on to pinch um and it, it was kind of a tough transition actually um so for a lot of teams in the north region actually uh I would say a, a very small percentage of the dodgeball hours that we've logged have been uh, with foam. So for for all of those players, it was definitely a tough transition going from foam where uh, you have a slightly different throw and, and it kind of makes your arms sore and your back sore in a, in a different way than than a rubber dodgeball would be. Uh, so for those players, they're, they're probably feeling it a little bit differently than, than they usually are in, in our... Uh, elite tournaments where we go from from open division to pinch division gotcha yeah and earlier you'd, you'd said that uh boosh had won foam um were there any other teams that like really stood out or any players that were just um i guess just really on that weekend or, or really played really awesome sure um yeah i'll just go through uh so boosh won um and that team obviously they're known as a very good uh, foam team. Um, and they took us out. They took out Dynasty in the finals. They actually uh, came back from the loser's bracket and were able to beat us twice in a row Oh wow! Uh, in the finals. Um, and then Task Force uh, took third place, and they looked really good uh, in foam. So I know they didn't even make it to the finals, but uh, I'm not taking any, anything away from Task Force. They had a really, really good uh team for foam division um and then i believe kraken took fourth place uh, unfortunately dynasty wasn't able to match up against kraken at all in this tournament but uh 
they looked really good as well. They had some really close games with Task Force. I know that uh, in round robin, their game came down to uh, a sudden death uh, one-on-one. So that was one of the most exciting games of the day. Um, and then if I were to mention a, just a couple other teams that looked good, I would say Corruption. Uh, and I know they didn't have their full roster, but that's another team out of Chicago that uh, they looked pretty good in foam division. And I know not all of them are are used to playing foam. Um, and then uh, it was really cool to see a, a team called Ohio Legacy, and they're new to uh, playing in elite, playing in all of these other tournaments. Um, that's a group of uh, college dodgeball players that uh, I'm not sure other than two or three of them, I'm not sure any of them have played in anything outside of uh, the NCDA. So it was cool to see them uh, come to this tournament and sort of branch out. And hopefully that uh, is just a sign of things to come and they'll uh, start playing in more uh, more elite tournaments as well. Yeah, it's it's always awesome to see uh, new teams come in. You definitely want them to uh, to come out, play, compete, um, and see what's out there in terms of like high level competition. So, and that that was mostly just foam that you broke down, right? As far as teams went. Yeah, yeah. So those uh those for the foam division, um, and th- those are just a few teams to to mention. I think that there were fifteen total teams there. Uh, maybe it was fourteen, but uh, there was a lot of good competition. Nice. Um, so going into the the pinch uh, division, um, what teams you know who showed up? Uh, what what players stood out? Um, can you give me like a rundown? Uh, yeah. So, oh man, it's gonna be tough to uh, kind of <laughs> re- recall everything from that. Um, just because it, it was different teams than what we usually have. Uh, but uh, the team that ended up winning the pinch division was. Uh, the team that had uh, Andrew Ketchum, uh, Glenn was also on that team. He was the first pick, and uh, Ketchum ended up getting the first pick. We drew drew out of a hat, so uh, he was lucky to get Glenn there. Um, but they ended up winning. They had a really good team, uh, and it was surprising because uh, Andrew Ketchum, coming from the West Coast, uh, wasn't as familiar with all of the names on the list when we went through to draft, uh, but he ended up picking a really good roster and the back end of his roster did uh, a really good job at that tournament too. Um, second place team was uh, Dylan Fettig. He's uh, one of my teammates on Dynasty uh, and he drafted a really solid team as well. He ended up picking up uh, a couple of the players that were on on uh, Legacy uh, I believe. So they're uh, players that are used to, used to playing pinch division um, so they were, they were steals in the draft, I guess, but those were the top two teams and, uh, it was, it was just really fun to play with, uh, new players, uh, and, and then compete against some of your teammates as well. So it was a different format, uh, but I would definitely recommend people, uh, try that out. If, if you have a tournament where there's some time where you can fit in another round where, you know, it's something where you can do a draft or do a hat tournament, whatever it might be. Yeah, I know uh, Tyler had mentioned that he'd wanted to do a draft maybe during one of his uh, Tribune tournaments. And so it'd be interesting. Like you, like we um, here in Phoenix, sometimes we'll do like a random draw. And those are a blast because you, you just don't know who you're going to end up with. But um, a deliberate draw, that's um, that sounds pretty cool. It sounds like it'd be a lot of fun. And go figure, catch him actually chooses a good team. Um, I just figured uh, he was going to hop on, I think, with – isn't he on your team now for uh, for pinch? Is that just elite or? Um, no. So uh, so we brought Ketchum to to the tourney for the foam division. Um, so he was on our team for that. But uh, obviously, with this one being a draft, he wasn't he right. wasn't on our team for uh, for the pinch division. And uh, no, he won't be on our on our normal team outside of that tournament. But it was really fun to bring him out for this this uh tourney i know he was there last year as well uh, i forget what team he was on there but yeah it was a lot of fun we we had uh andrew ketchum as one of our free agent pickups and then we also had uh, a guy named tyler gregory from uh grand rapids that we picked up for this this tournament because a couple of our 
uh, regular players weren't able to show up. Gotcha. I think yeah. I'm I'm trying to re- I'm recalling the the meme is like who's that Pokemon and it was Ketchum. So yeah. was that what that was for? Yep. Yeah. That was oh, okay. that was for uh, just for this tournament, but yeah, it took us way too long to to do that Photoshop there. So <laughs> gotcha. Um, cool. Yeah, I I thought that was like for for Pinch for Elite, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like that's. Oh. <laughs> That's a bit much, man. <laughs> that that would be a bit much, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. And cool. you actually, I know you mentioned the um, how you guys do like a hat draw. And I guess my question for you would be, what? which would you prefer? Would it be a, a hat draw type of a tournament? Or would it be uh, where, where it's sort of like a deliberate draft? Because that was kind of the question that we had. We were not sure which we would do for this tournament. And... There's pros and cons to both, definitely. Um, I mean, so when we do our random draw, it's like it's for a, a, a rec league, so it's it's going to be you're stuck with the same team for you know eight, ten weeks or whatever, and that's that's oh, a lot okay. more fun. That that prevents like the hurt feelings, I guess, that you would probably get from a draw, which is the only con I can think of. Yeah. Um, I did play in some random draw tournaments, and those are a blast, but like an actual full on um where you know you're, you're drafting where you're picking people um i think that'd just be a lot of fun and um without upsetting people if you are not picked first and you're picked last and you're upset about it that should just tell you something about how you need to play so you can get better so that being said um i would be down for uh an actual um draft tournament or league that, that's just a whole nother element of play. Like you get to play with the people that you want to, not just the ones that you have for your team. So I'm curious to see how, if, if Tyler actually goes forth and does an actual draft tournament, I wonder if the same issues that you would have with the rec league would happen in a quote unquote professional style environment. I don't know if mm-hmm. that answers your question. I, I would be down regardless. Uh, I'm always happy to play with, new teams and, and new players, um, especially if it's for like a one day thing, totally down for that. Um, ego aside, if I got picked last and fine, I'll just try to do better next time. And, and that's it. I mean, let's play. So that's, that's just me. Yep. I agree. Did you, uh, so, so speaking of that, did, did you guys get any flack for, um, the draft or was there any issues that you guys had to deal with or were people pretty much open to it and those that wanted to play played and, and that was the end of it? Uh, yeah, there wasn't really any complaints about it. I know that, uh, I guess the one drawback that I would say for, uh, a hat tournament or a hat draw pretty much, uh, would be, uh, with the random draw, there might be a team that ends up being stacked and then a team that ends up, uh, having a huge disadvantage. So, uh, that was one of the reasons why we ended up doing the draft where, uh, each of the team captains sort of had a good idea of who the players were, uh, and it was going to end up being, a pretty even competition throughout uh and that's what it ended up looking like where there were a lot of close games a lot of exciting games and that's what you want in dodgeball so it, it turned out really well at, at this tourney gotcha um do you have any plays that stand stand out in your mind still uh, that you can recall or any like 1v1s or anything like specific that really just was exciting to watch yeah so um I'm trying to think of some for the foam division, but in the pinch division, there was, I think it was the semifinals match. Um, uh, and it was Dylan Fedig's team against uh, Alex Watkins. Uh, he's a player that's on uh, Windy City Corruption. Um, and I forget that their, their team names for this tournament. What we did was we had all of the uh, North elite teams that are no longer in existence. Uh, we used those as the team names for the pinch division. So each one of the captains got to claim uh, a name of a team like um, Bear Jordan or uh, Final <laughs> Justice or, or one of those teams. I'm not sure how familiar you are with that. I know Final Justice. I, I yeah, all name. of the teams that uh, used to exist but uh, have died off since then. So, um, but yeah, the one the one play that stands out to me would be it was a one on one between those two guys, and it lasted for a good eight minutes it seemed like uh and it was just back and forth uh and it was really late in the tournament everyone's arms were completely done um so neither of them could get that great of a throw off 
uh, and, and they were just placing their throws where it wasn't going to be catchable. Uh, and each time the other guy seemed to be looking for a catch because they knew the throw wasn't going to be all that hard. Uh, and it just, for some reason, it took that long before uh, Dylan ended up uh, hitting him. I think I think he hit him in the leg, but it, it was a really, really long one-on-one. And uh, I don't remember the last time I've seen a one-on-one take that long. So it was interesting. Does that uh, so do long drawn out? And I'm not trying to say this with like a negative connotation or anything, but do long drawn out one on ones happen in pinch often, or are they just so fast that it's rare that it even occurs? Uh, I would say I I don't think that they happen more frequently in pinch than in other divisions. Right. I think that the issue here was that uh, we were playing with uh, a longer throw line than what we're used to in elite. So in elite, it's a 25 foot throw line, uh, for pinch division. Uh, and then in this tournament specifically, it was 27 feet. Plus when you add on the fact that it was soft boundaries, so you could step out with one foot that gives you kind of a foot or two more leeway where you, uh, I guess it's a little bit further of a throw when you think about how they can step back to dodge. Right. Uh, so it was close to like a 30 foot throw at that point. And adding on to it, the fact that uh, they were just completely exhausted at that point uh, and the other player was either going to be able to block it easily or look for a catch, uh, they were always placing their throws where it wasn't going to be a catchable ball and half the time it would end up you know, bouncing short or being too high or whatever it was. So gotcha. I'm, I'm not sure that that happens that much more often in pinch than other divisions. I would say it maybe happens less just because of the fact that your pinch can be so intense and people can get uh, such strong throws in when it's coming from 25 feet away. Right. This is going to sound super nerdy, but I wonder if um, psychologically, if I, if I know that, okay, my heel is where the line is, so I, I cannot move my body any more backwards, otherwise I'm out. I wonder if psychologically, if I can, if I know that I can step back, that for some reason gives me more confidence or more uh, wiggle room or just some kind of weird advantage over um, a hard line. So I wonder if maybe that might have factored into the, the, that rule where you can have one limb in and, and one limb out. That's uh, that's that's new to me. That, that's kind of a cool thought, though. Um, yeah, but, I think it probably does, actually. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's any better or any worse, but, uh, yeah, the fact that you know that you have that option available where you can move uh, step back with your leg instead of just if you're standing on the back line with hard boundaries you have 180 degrees that you can you know move in but if if it's uh soft boundaries you know that you can step back with either leg you have that type of uh i guess confidence yeah you're not when as, the ball's coming at you you're not as rigid yeah huh, i'll have to i'll have to try that someday and see if that changes um my my attitude i guess of, of how you know, because you think you're backed up against the wall, that's that that definitely changes the way you uh you set up your posture and and what you're gonna do. But um, I won't stay on that too much. Um, I did want to ask: Were there any players that like shocked you, or like any any sleepers who were just like, "Whoa, where'd that guy come from?" Or people that you're like really excited to see hop into the elite competitive scene that showed up last weekend? Yeah. So I'll I'll go back to talking about the foam division because that was obviously the main event at this tournament, and that's when we were on our set teams. Um, I guess some of the standouts, well, for Boosh, uh, Stone obviously is one of the best foam players out there, and then uh, they picked up Cody Stidham, uh, and I believe he's from from Texas, uh, but he was really really good in the in the foam division, uh, and then. Uh, Derek jo- Johnson, I'm not sure if you uh, know who that is. He's the guy that won the clutch grips uh, competition, but he was uh, incredible in, in foam division, both catching and he had a cannon, um, especially when we were throwing the the seven inch foam balls. Um, so those three guys for or yeah, those three guys for Boosh were were standouts in my opinion. Gotcha. So uh, it's it's been really exciting to see USA Dodgeball popping up um, everywhere, um, and, and I saw them um, attached to you guys. Uh, did they have like a specific role at that tournament, or were they kind of just there to lend support? Or can can you speak to their involvement at all? 
Yeah, so um, it was it was an official uh, USA Dodgeball event. Um, nice. And with that, obviously, you got the uh, uh, they live stream some of the some of the tournament. Uh, I think they live streamed the finals for foam division and for pinch division. Um, but also, uh, which was pretty cool, was the fact that uh, Brett Furlong, a uh, player from Task Force, uh, he's one of the people who's uh, picking the USA Team USA Dodgeball. Uh, so he was there. Uh, and with that comes the uh, pressure of uh, you've got to pr- perform really well in the foam division because uh, there's some eyes on you to... Scouts uh, watching now. Yeah, maybe see if you're good enough to, to make Team USA. Um so that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah, talk about uh, new dynamics. I mean, let alone, okay, cool. I'll get over the whole one limb out, one limb in thing. But like, okay, now I'm I'm playing and people are scouting me, watching me because I want to play on Team USA. That's that's pretty legit. That's, uh, that's definitely new and exciting to hear about. I know uh, Tyler mentioned that just out of convenience, there was a, a couple scouts at the Tribune. And so... Now I wonder, like, are, are people going to be playing now with that in mind? Like, it's it's not enough just to be the best. It's not just enough to, to compete and do well for your team. Now it's, hey, somebody's watching me play for Team USA, potentially. I want to do especially good. Um, I, I don't want to go back into the subject, but did people just go, like, lights out because of this fact, do you think? Or did it not really in, in, impact the game that much? That's a that's a good point. I guess, um, I guess it depends on, depends on your... Uh, specific opinion or how you approach competition but I think for me uh, uh, it didn't really cross my mind at all if you're a competitor you want to win regardless you want to play your best regardless right um so the fact that there's someone there scouting uh, I don't in my opinion I don't think that it should cross your mind that that that's uh, that specific thing should cross your mind when you're competing I think that it's just an added um an added thing when it comes to uh, drawing people in to go to the tournaments uh, and it's just cool to mention that there is someone there but yeah I wonder if, if that affects the way that anyone competed at this tournament hopefully it doesn't make anyone uh, play more selfishly or try and try and be someone that makes more throws than than they usually would because right. uh, that would be one drawback to it but I I really doubt that that happens, happened with anyone yeah, you kind of have a good point. Like, it, it should already be there. You just show up, you play like you normally would, and let the yeah. uh, let your actions speak for themselves and, and not try to be extra or what have you. Cool. So uh, I guess the, the only other question I really have is, um, and I, I kind of have to switch this question around a little bit because you're more of a, of a player in this event, but is there anybody that you would like to give, like, a shout-out to or, or thank for making this happen? Yeah. Um, so... First and foremost, I would say huge thank you to USA uh, Dodgeball for, uh, I guess, running this event. Um, but yeah, Tony Stumpo, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Paul Hillebrand, uh, Kelvin Coster, those were the guys that uh, did the most uh, when it came to running this tournament. And they were extremely flexible the entire time. Uh, and also in uh, leading up to the tournament with uh, planning it and changing a few things uh, to kind of make the event as good as it could be. Um, so yeah, huge thanks to those guys as well as, um, Felix Peroni, who, who's part of the, uh, USA dodgeball board. And then, uh, obviously, uh, Furlong, as I mentioned, who was there to, uh, to scout people. And, you know, maybe we had some, uh, team USA players in attendance. Awesome. Cool. It, it's, uh, it's exciting seeing everything come together. I mean, it's, it's been, a while um i don't know if you know this but I'm, I'm a fossil i've been around for like 14 years and to see it all finally starting to coalesce into something where there's consistency there's great competition people are stepping up there's scouts now it's it's really exciting and so um definitely appreciate you hopping on and uh wrapping with me for a little bit and, and kind of giving me some insight on, on what took place last weekend it, it definitely seemed intense and um really hoping to cover more stuff like that so appreciate your, your time there yeah, well, th- thank you so much for having me, and yeah, I'm sure that um, I guess I'm taking a little bit it for granted uh, the fact that dodgeball's you know exploding as much as it is the last couple years. But uh, yeah, someone like you that can have that type of appreciation um, to see how far it's come, it, it must be really exciting.
Yeah, it definitely is. Okay, well, there you go. There's a hopefully pretty quick uh, recap of last weekend's Grand Rapids Open Tournament. Kevin, again, thank you so much for hopping on last minute and being willing to uh, put yourself out there and, and give me some insight on what took place, on who to look for, um, just what went down. It's, uh, it's definitely a goal of mine, like I said in the episode with Tyler, to, to also capture some of the uh, events that are coming up and just get out of the... Arizona, Southern California bubble that, that I'm kind of in. So definitely appreciate input, especially from new voices, new faces, new players. Um, as always, please feel free to send your comments, feedback, suggestions, gripes, complaints, whatever you want, send it my way. Till then, have a great uh, weekend and I'll catch you guys next week. Bye.